Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon, everyone. Great to have you all here. Greetings from the University of Finley, right here in Finley, Ohio. I'm your host, Julie Klingler, and I serve as the director of the Wolf Center for Alumni, Parents, and Friends. Uh, today, we welcome back our lifelong learning community back to, uh, back to our virtual sessions. We are so glad to see everyone here today. We're very excited you're here, whether you're uh, a loyal UF supporter or you're new to us, we are glad you joined us today from wherever you are globally. Um, we have had a great lineup of lifelong learning sessions um, this month, ranging in topics from history to uh, military experience, medical, psychology, financial. Uh, we do animal research on topics next week and community updates along with volunteerism in the area. So we've got a lot to cover. Um, next week, but today coming up in just a few minutes, we've got a great presentation that every single person everywhere should hear. We've got two wonderful attorneys joining us, Matt Black, Principal Chief Strategy Officer, yes, from Trust Company Family um, Offices, and Bob Shuck right here from Law, uh, Shuck Law Office. Uh, in Finley, and along with my colleague, um, Ken McIntyre. These um, exceptional experts are going to help you assemble the great um, eight essential documents that you need to keep your estate in tip-top shape. Um, they will be taking your questions, uh, so I hope you have your list ready for them today. I want to cover just a few announcements. We want you to make the most of this virtual event, so we always try to point out at the bottom of your screen uh, the chat feature, so please drop your comments in the chat and reconnect with your friends that way. We also have a Q&A feature down there, too. Um, I, we hope you've brought questions with you, and drop those questions into that Q&A section, and then we'll have a Q&A at the end. Um, identify yourself too with a great name we need first and last name if we're going to address you uh, with questions and also um, we will use those names um, for prizes at the end we're going to do a wheel of names um, spin which is a lot of fun and we'll give away a special prize at the end so stay with us for that giveaway you have to be present to win it so without further ado i'd like to introduce our prestigious panel today um, i will start off with bob um, Bob Shuck was born in Finley and graduated from Finley High School. He also graduated from Miami University in 1979 and obtained his Juris Doctorate from Oral Roberts University and a Master's of Arts in Communication from Regent University. He was admitted to the Ohio Bar in 1983 and has practiced law in Finley since 1989, focusing on estate planning. Bob is married to Margaret and has two children, Robbie and Hannah. Um, now, Matt. Matt Black is Chief Strategy Officer and Principal with Trust Company Family Offices. He is a graduate of Miami University and the Louis D. Brandes School of Law at the University of Louisville. Matt has worked in bank trust departments for 22 years. He lives in Finley with his wife, Renee, four kids, and a hyperactive labradoodle. <laughs> I love that. And then Ken, of course, Ken, my colleague right here at the University of Finley, has been a nonprofit business leader since 1994, first with the YMCA of Greater Toledo, and then serving the alumni of Bowling Green State University. While with BGSU, Ken served in a variety of fundraising and relationship management positions, ending his 14 year run with the organization as the director of plan giving. He arrived at the University of Finley in March of 2020 and has served in the role of Director of Gift Planning for a little over a year. With every interaction, Ken has worked uh, with UF alumni, friends, and supporters. He strives to add value to others and foster an atmosphere of generosity. He truly believes it's better to give than to receive. He is a native of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and he lives in Sylvania, Ohio, with his wife of 25 years, Lisa, and three children, Hannah, Kinnan, and Annalise. So without further ado, welcome all three panelists. And at this point, Ken, I will turn the presentation over to you. And Ken, you are muted. Unmute for us, please. There we are, how's that, hey, better? Good, very good. 
Thank you, Julie. I appreciate the, uh, the nice warm introduction there. Uh, I will say uh, also a thank you to um, Bob and Matt. They are uh, members of our plan giving council here at the University of Finley and generously uh, volunteering their time and knowledge to help us uh, walk through these uh, 101s of uh, a good plan giving, um, plan, or not plan giving, a good uh, estate plan that each and every person uh, needs to have. Um, nailed down so that they can leave a, uh, a legacy of significance for those who follow behind them. So, and uh, to get going, uh, just to give you a, a brief idea, we are going to cover a lot of information in a short period of time. Uh, our agenda for the day uh, is to touch on these eight topics, uh, table of contents for important documents, will and testament, uh, trust, the revocable living trust, power of attorneys, living will, beneficiary designations, uh, digital as asset provision, and finally the letter of intent. Uh, so that's a lot of things and we can probably do an hour to an hour and a half on each and every one of those, but we are gonna be do hitting these briefly, giving you a, a bit of information on that and then looking forward to questions that you probably have on these particular uh, items uh, since that many of these might be familiar to you. So, well, let's get right started here. We're gonna jump right into the table of contents for important documents. And basically what that is, it's a list of all of the things that anyone and everyone would need to know about once uh, you are no longer with us. When you pass, somebody has to come behind you to put all these things in order. And so what is really nice is to have everything listed or at least where everything can be found listed in one place. This would be a very important document. Some of those things I have listed here, you'll wanna talk about investment portfolios, where are they at, who your investment people are, um, lawyers that you use, safety deposit boxes, where it's at, where the key is at, uh, car titles, deeds, ownership papers. All of these things should be in one place or instructions to get to them should be in one place so that whoever is your executor or uh, your trustees can come behind you, find these, these things easily and begin uh, closing your state for you. Um, pension, life insurance policies, bank accounts, all of those things are on there. Just again, not an exhaustive list, but a, uh, a nice list of things to consider on the table of contents. And now to Bob. Thank you, Ken. It's nice to be with you all today. <clears throat> Uh, your last will and testament is a very basic document in, with estate planning. And interestingly enough, I, I put some statistics on here. 41% uh, of American adults don't have a will. That's USA Today. ARC says 60%. And Gallup poll said 44%. So you average those out, and they're probably about 50%. And surprisingly enough, uh, half of all Americans don't have a will. And uh, I guess a lot of people think that time's never gonna come, but it does to all of us. So um, we do need a will and COVID-19 especially has increased, I think more than anything, people's consciousness about the fact that they need a will and that time is not infinite, at least on this earth. It may be in the hereafter and I, believe that it is, but uh, we need, to, we need to, to be prepared, as the Boy Scouts would say. So uh, we need to do our estate plan. Uh, Ken, is there the next slide? There we go. Thank you. Uh, a, pro, a, a, a will, last will and testament, uh, is, is when after you pass away and the will has been admitted to probate, that means the papers have been filed, then the probate court supervises the transfer of your assets to distribution to your heirs pursuant to the terms of your last will and testament. If you don't have a will, the Ohio Revised Code directs uh, through a statute of descent and distribution, how the property will pass, which means that it goes to your next of kin. So if you're an individual, it would be your spouse first, 
then it'd be your parents, then it'd be your siblings, then it'd be your, uh, well, be your children, I guess, after your, after your spouse, um, and uh, so on and so forth. So it is really important to name those that you want to receive your property. You can include uh, what's called a testamentary trust, which is different from what Matt's gonna talk about in a few minutes, a testamentary trust springs up through your last will and testament. It's usually for minors and it's subject to the jurisdiction and the over oversight of the probate court to make sure the funds that are, are used as you designate. And uh, you have a named executor in your will and they carry out your wishes. And it's important to have that because if you if you don't, uh, if you don't have that, and someone is appointed as an administrator of your estate, because you don't have a will, you've died in test state, that means they will have to post a bond, which is an insurance policy, basically, to protect the heirs in the event of any misdeeds by the administrator. But in your will, if you have an executor, you can name someone, and you can waive bond so that they don't have to post that bond. So there's an, an expense that, uh, that is unnecessary and won't have to happen if you have made a will already and named someone. Well, hey, uh, Ken, Bob, thank you guys. Um, good afternoon, everyone. It's really a pleasure to be here with you today and uh, to, to participate. Um, you know, maybe you can relate to this cartoon a little bit. Um, I, I certainly find that the better I get to know uh, my own children, uh, the more this uh, cartoon resonates with me. Um, so I, I, I kid about that, except for on some days. Um, Ken, you, you can go ahead and uh, advance the slide, Ken. Um, as Bob mentioned, I'm gonna chat a little bit about revocable living trusts. Uh, what they are, what they are not. Um, very popular planning vehicle. Um, and uh, I'll, I'll talk about what they are first. Um, they're uh, very popular for probate avoidance. Um, that's, that's how most people come to uh, consider the use of a revocable living trust. And um, in most cases, avoiding probate is really the number one reason my clients like to use that revocable trust for estate planning. In many cases, they don't necessarily understand why probate avoidance might be desirable. So hold that thought for a minute. I'm gonna to come to that, come back to that. Um, they do provide some protection in case of incapacity. Um, so if uh, you have assets titled in your revocable trust and you become incapacitated, your successor trustee, which you will have named in that document, uh, can step into your shoes and use those assets to take care of you and your family as you direct in that trust document. So it's not a replacement for a power of attorney, which we'll get to in a little bit, um, but it can supplement that power of attorney and can be very useful um, as, as a protective device in the case of your incapacity in a way that would not involve um, court supervised guardianship, which can be expensive, time-consuming, and uh, a tremendous hassle. Um, it is a flexible document. You can, re you can remote revoke it or amend it at any time. And at the end of the day, um, it is the, the backbone uh, of your estate plan if you use that revocable living trust as part of your planning. Um, once you've passed, that revocable trust sort of acts as a will substitute, which outlines the distribution of your estate. And so that can be outright distributions to your heirs, or it can be in a continued trust format. Um, and so upon your passing, that trust becomes irrevocable. But during your lifetime, it's, it's a revocable document, fully amendable. Which leads to the, the next point. Uh, one of the things that a revocable trust is not is a tax reduction or tax avoidance um, entity. Um, any assets that you hold in your revocable trust during your lifetime are, are for all intents and purposes treated as your own assets. So uh, any of the income tax ramifications to that trust pass directly through to you. 
Um, and uh, by placing those assets in that revocable trust, you're not uh, avoiding estate taxes per se. Um, so important to bear in mind. Also, revocable trust is not a creditor protection platform. It is not a device to protect from your creditors during your lifetime. Um, if you have a creditor, a judgment creditor, a divorce creditor, uh, whatever the case may be, that creditor steps into your shoes and can access any funds that you can access. And so uh, because your revocable trust is fully revocable and amendable, um, it uh, does not provide any creditor protection to you during your lifetime. Uh, now, it can provide creditor protection for your heirs and beneficiaries once you've passed, uh, but important to note, not during your own lifetime. It is not, uh, along those same lines, not a protective device from Medicaid estate recovery. Um, and uh, we, we get those questions a lot. That is a very specific type of irrevocable trust. Uh, you really want to work with an elder law expert in, if, if that's something that's important to your planning. Um, again, your revocable trust does not provide that protection. Um, and then finally, it is, it's not the only document you need or something that you sign and forget. Um, life changes happen. Um, you still want your full suite of estate planning documents, which would include a will, which would cover any assets which you don't title in your revocable trust, um, as well as your powers of attorney and your healthcare proxies, which uh, Bob will, will chat about a little bit here as well. So again, um, I, I said, hold that thought around probate avoidance. So um, Bob spoke a little bit about uh, probating a will and appointing, appointing your executor to, uh, to administer that will. And so, you know, what's the big deal with probate avoidance? Um, I will say uh, upfront in Ohio, particularly, probate is not the terrible nightmare that many make it out to be. Um, that can vary from state to state. If you are a Florida resident or a California resident, um, those probate processes are more onerous and costly. Um, and so depending on where you live may, may prompt you uh, to have a little more urgency to do revocable trust planning potentially. Furthermore, anywhere, any jurisdiction, any state where you own real estate in your sole name would require a separate probate uh, to be opened. So as an example, um, you, your main residence is in Ohio, you have a cottage in Michigan and a condo in Florida. Uh, all in your sole name. Uh, if you pass away, you are looking at probate in three separate states. And uh, that really is a hassle and complex and unnecessary. And so uh, by titling those assets in your revocable trust during your lifetime, uh, you can avoid those probate uh, actions. And so um, that you, you can streamline the process. You can uh, reduce some court costs, as Bob mentioned as well. But I will say the number one reason, absolutely hands down, uh, number one reason why my clients uh, usually prefer to use a revocable living trust is for the privacy factor. Um, Bob mentioned, uh, if you pass away, you filed your will with, um, with the clerk of courts in, in the county where you, of, your, of your domicile. So that's a public document. Um, Anyone can go on down to that uh, to the clerk's office and and get a copy of that will once estate once the estate is open. In Ohio, three months after the will is filed, um, and the executor must file an inventory. And so at that point, um, anyone can go and look in that file and see what you owned at the time of your death uh, and who gets it. And so um, you know maybe you don't care about that. You say I'm going to be gone. I don't care. But um, for some folks, uh, if, if you just assume that not be the case, uh, by funding your revocable trust during your lifetime, um, that revocable trust is not a probate document, it's not a public document, it's a private contractual arrangement and not subject to uh, the eyes of the public. And so that, that would be the, the primary reason why we see people preferring that revocable trust. And so at this point, I will turn it back over to Bob to chat a bit about powers of attorney. All 
I see a question came in uh, regarding uh, whether probate is handled by the county or, or by the state. It is overseen by the, the county court where the will is filed. And so, uh, and the, the state sets the uh, executor's fee, but the local rule of court sets the attorney fee, or I should say an attorney fee guideline. But the, the rules, the laws, the, the forms we follow are promulgated by the state, but it's done at a state level. Uh, the business power of attorney is, is very important because it does away with the need for a guardianship through the probate court should you become incapacitated. A business power of attorney, or some sometimes you've heard it called a durable power of attorney. Um, all business powers of attorney need to be durable. A, a power of attorney, it used to be that the power of attorney uh, ended or became obsolete if the person lost their competency. Uh, Alzheimer's, stroke, whatever. And finally, about 50 years ago, people said, well, what good is that? So they introduced something that uh, said that that if the la if the language in the power of attorney says it survives the un incompetency of the principal, then it is durable. So that means that if your your power of attorney and most all of them have this now, I'd be surprised to see one that didn't. But uh, you know if it says that, then the whole po point of that is that it continues on if you become incompetent. If you don't have a business power of attorney, the only choice then is for the court to appoint the person it decides to make your financial decisions, pay your bills, access your accounts, driver's licenses, deeds, all things that are related to your finances. It doesn't mean you have to own a business. It just means that you, everyone has business they conduct, whether they own a formal business or not. So it's your financial uh, agent, basically. And uh, it can be general for, for everything, or it can be limited to certain things. It becomes active once it's signed. And that's why it's important to know where the original is and where the copies are, because you don't want them floating around. Uh, it can always be revoked. It's a uh, principal agent sort of relationship. The one that makes it is the principal. The one that is the is the power of attorney is the agent. So it can always be revoked by the principal until such time as the ma maker would become incompetent. It should be durable, as I said, and it does avoid the need for guardianship. Then there's another, you, you hear a dur people get these confused. There's a dur durable power of attorney for business, as we discussed. But there's also a durable power of attorney for healthcare. And these really started coming about in the early 90s when Dr. Kravorkian was in the headlines and people were so afraid we were going to have euthanasia for the elderly and so forth. So the, the state legislature dipped its toe in the water and authorized this durable power of attorney for health care, which basically you could name an agent, name someone to be your health care agent to make medical decisions, but it was only good for seven years and then it expired. Well, after a while, people realized that this was not such a terrible thing. And so they broadened it and uh, they made it good forever until you revoke it. Once you sign it, and um, there's an optional provision in there about nutrition and hydration. You remember the, the stories we heard about people, you know, Terri Ann Schiavo, her husband wanted to remove her from life, from, from uh, nutrition and hydration, the feeding tube, and her parents did not. And there was a big battle in the court. Um, you know, we don't always need uh, life support but we always have to have nutrition and hydration, whether we're well or not. So uh, this option, if you check it, allows them to remove the feeding tube. Uh, if your physician and another physician have determined that you're permanently unconscious, which means brain dead essentially, 
and I have not had too many clients that said, yes, I'd like to lay there in the bed and have my organs keep working and, you know, ad infinitum. People feel like when it's, when I've lost my, my ability to be conscious, I want to go on to the next stage. So um, in, in Ohio, to be valid, they can either be witnessed by two uh, uh, witnesses or by uh, a notary public, and it can be revoked or changed uh, at any time. Then the other document there with that is a living will, focuses on end of life circumstances, more on I don't want artificial life support. It trumps the durable power of attorney for health care if there is a question. Okay, unmuting here. So um, I'm going to jump into the use of beneficiary designations within your planning. Um, it's, it's a part of the estate plan, which often doesn't get thought of as, as estate planning. It often gets short shrift. Um, however, it, it, is, it is crucial that you review your beneficiary designation so that you don't accidentally wreck your estate plan. Um, I, I, for example, um, your will or your trust might direct that, um, you know, let, let, let's suppose you have a child that has um, substance abuse problems, as an example. And so your, your will or your trust directs that that child's um, assets or their share of your assets are held in a continued trust for their benefit. Um, but uh, your IRA, which may be the bulk of your wealth, uh, simply names your children as equal beneficiaries. Um, and without anything further, uh, those children would, would, at your passing, be able to withdraw the entire amount um, uh, immediately. So which that, that could run uh, quite counter to, to the wishes of your estate plan. And uh, so you need to bear in mind that those beneficiary designations um, override any appointment that you have in your will or trust. It's a separate contractual arrangement. Um, and, and so, uh, you know, again, examples that we have listed here, uh, IRAs, 401ks, and life insurance are really the biggies where, where that can come into, into play. Um, but uh, any other asset that is controlled by a beneficiary designation or a, a POD, TOD, payable on death, transfer on death type of designation, um, as well as assets held jointly with rights of survivorship. All of those um, are contractual ways of dealing with estate assets uh, that override and trump any appointment that you have in your will or revocable trust. So um, they don't pass through probate. Uh, so they, that's, that's useful for that if, if uh, probate avoidance is one of your goals. Um, but I, I guess, again, I would simply stress that um, care should be taken to coordinate those beneficiary designations along with the rest of your estate plan uh, so that it all works together as a whole. And then finally, um, I'll make some mention here of really something, uh, a topic that just a few short years ago, we didn't think about at all. We, we didn't have to consider because uh, many of these, these uh, concepts didn't even exist. Um, but, um, you know, we live more and more, uh, uh, gosh, case in point here, we're having our meeting um, virtually, digitally. Um, and, and so uh, we're conducting more and more of our lives online. Um, I, I won't provide any commentary as to whether that's a good thing or a bad thing. Uh, nonetheless, it should be considered when you're doing your planning. And so uh, I, I give just a few things to consider, um, it, most certainly not exhaustive. Um, from the very simple, I, I mentioned hardware. Um, you know, does anyone keep a family picture album anymore? Uh, you, you don't see them sitting on a coffee table. Uh, instead, you might have a thumb drive that has, um, you know, th maybe thousands of pictures on it. Um, and so that might be really important to some family members. And so consider, consider that little thumb drive, that, that little piece of hardware um, that may contain some really um, emotionally valuable um, uh, matter on it. 
Um, think about your social media accounts and your email accounts. Um, if you pass away, those still exist out there online. And so you'll want to make provision as to who can control those and um, shut them down, wind them up um, and so forth, uh, as well as access them uh, once you're gone. Um, you need to think about who has access to your passwords, who needs access to your passwords. Um, I will mention that uh, it, as painful as this can be, you're, you're gonna wanna take a look at the terms of service for uh, the various online platforms that you use. Uh, I'll use Google as a good example. Um, you know, if you use uh, Gmail, uh, Google Docs, so on and so forth, um, you know, you've got a, quite a bit of information out there. And uh, Google specifically, for instance, does allow you to go into your account settings and uh, make provision to authorize people uh, as you direct um, who, as to who can access and control your Google accounts if you're not able to because you're either incapacitated or uh, deceased. So review those terms of service, again, as painful as that may be. And, um, you know, and, and again, there's, you know, things that you might want to think about if many of us now have financial accounts where we don't even get a paper statement. So, um, you know, make sure that uh, your your executor is aware of that. Um, otherwise, they they might not know that you have that that account out there. Um, I'm from Louisville, Kentucky originally. I have a Twin Spires account wherein I can bet on horse racing online. I'm, I, I admit it. Um, it's uh, it's it's my only vice. Okay, right. Um, and and so uh, I don't. I certainly don't get a paper statement for that. And so uh, you know. I think I've, I've got a couple dollars in there that that ought to be dealt with if something happens to me. Um, maybe you share your Amazon account with your family. Um, I know within my own family, several of us family members can log into Amazon and click click buy and send, and it, it comes to the house and the account gets magically debited. Would you want that to continue on after you've passed? Maybe not. Cryptocurrency more and more uh, prevalent, more and more in the news. Um, you know, if you don't have, if, if your executor doesn't have your, that, that access key, that, that, dis that, that can disappear, uh, without that, without that key. Um, so, uh, I, I also finally mentioned digital liabilities there, you know, what that, what might that be? Well, um, think about how many things you have set up on auto pay. Um, think of the things that just magically get paid out of your, out of your accounts. Uh, because you set them up that way so you don't have to think about it. Um, so uh, all of those things, uh, you know, think about what, what needs to happen there um, if you're either incapacitated or, or gone. And uh, again, um, uh, adding a little bit of complexity here, but um, some of those things are very important to, uh, to your overall financial picture and, and should be considered when you sit down with, uh, with your attorney. Um, and so with that, uh, I'll again turn it back to Ken. Matt, that is really, uh, really uh, good information. I am uh, excited to, to see that because it's something that a lot of people aren't considering. I'm also excited to learn that you have a uh, horse betting app. And I have this great nonprofit I want to talk to you about that, you know, if you ever hit the triple crown, where, where you could really do a lot of good. No one makes money on it. <laughs> No. Oh, okay. All right. Well, very good. So thank you for that, Matt. Uh, I'll talk about the very last piece of the estate plan here, and that is the letter of intent. Uh, the letter of intent is a um, is a uh, obviously an optional document, but something that I think uh, most people, given time to think about, would include in their estate planning. Uh, so the letter of intent is things that you could include um, your final wishes, how you'd like your funeral to go, anything special that you would like to have happen at your funeral, um, maybe even, you know, suggestions as to who you'd like to have speak um, or where your ashes are to be spread. Things like that can all be put into your letter of intent. Um, other things that can be put into the letter of intent could be Things that may not have a lot of monetary value, but a lot of uh, personal value, right? So if you have a baseball cap collection and a grandchild who loves wearing caps, you might say in your letter of intent, I would like my you know, grandson to have these caps or, um, or at least the majority thereof. Things that you wouldn't put into the will, but, uh, but are important to you. 
Um, and then a, another thing that you can be very creative with your letter of intent is to uh, give a little comfort to the family. Allow the family uh, to hear from you one last time. Things that, uh, things that you would want them to hear, things that you maybe have shared stories or, um, or thoughts that you've shared with them throughout the years that you were together with them. Um, let, them let them hear those through your letter of intent. Uh, in fact, I saw one uh, funeral where uh, the gentleman who had passed away taped a, um, an audio, video, an audio um, recording of himself as he was being put into the ground. And it was him saying, hey, hey, don't, don't put me in here. I'm not ready to go yet, right? And so a very serious moment became very fun and light and uh, happy for those who attended because he had a good five minutes worth of conversation with everybody who attended his funeral uh, from beyond the grave. So that is, that is the letter of intent, a great, a great piece to add to your state. Uh, so uh, finally, just a, a quick disclosure, as always, we want, just wanted to let you know that we're, you know, we're here uh, with the intent to provide some information but not to provide legal advice um, or something specific to your situation. Again, we encourage you to in include um, uh, professional legal and tax advisors to help you specifically with your, uh, with your case. So just uh, please know that as we, uh, as we proceed here. But I believe uh, if, we, if I am correct, we're at the place to answer any of the questions you may have yeah. and, uh, and bring them forward, right, Julie? Can we turn that back to yes. you? Yes, absolutely. So we've got some really great questions that were submitted. We had a couple of people click the raise hand button. And so if you've done that, and if you have a question and that's why you're clicking to raise your hand, please go ahead and put that question in the Q&A area and submit it. And we're gonna go through some of those right now and have our experts, Matt and Bob, uh, weigh in and, um, and answer those. So we're gonna do most of them live. Um, and we're gonna start with the first one that came in. And I know, Matt, you had weighed in a little bit on this one um, right when it came in. So let me repeat it for the rest of the group if they didn't hear it. And then maybe you can um, talk to us a little bit about this answer. So Mary Klein asks, what kinds of things might you wish to include in a will, but not in a revocable trust? Sure. So yeah, Matt, yep. tell us. So um, one item uh, very specifically that you would want to include in your will and, and not uh, it necessarily within your revocable trust would be uh, particularly in the case of if you had minor children um, you would want to nominate or name the guardians of those minor children um, in your will. Um, I will mention that, um, you know, the probate judge, the, 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 the court will give deference to that. Um, they have an obligation to always look out for the best interest of the child. Um, so just because you name someone as a guardian, um, is not a guarantee that that person would be the guardian um, if they, you know, let's say they were a felon or something like that. Um, however, the court will give deference to that. And that is um, the, the sort of thing that you would want to do in a will as opposed to a trust um, uh, in, in, the, in that specific instance. Uh, that, that would be one example. Okay. Bob, do you have anything to add to that? Um. No, I think that's that that's one of the main options as, as a, and in addition to the uh, the testamentary trust for minors, uh, you want to name someone who is uh, capable and uh, competent of handling finances, but they don't have to be the same person as the guardian of the person. You can have a guardian of the child, the the, the physical guardian but are the legal guardian, but then have another person, perhaps someone else that you know is more competent with finances to handle the financial affairs. So they could, they could be split that way. And uh, the other thing you can do with a will, and you could do this in a trust too, would be to do a, a, a memorandum that's incorporated by reference that names uh, various specific items. If you have a long list of family antiques and so forth, and you don't want to include that in your will, you can include that in a separate memorandum that's referenced in your last will and testament. Good. 
Very good. Um, we, we are getting a lot, of, a lot of questions. Let's go to the next one from Janice. Janice says, I have a will and powers of attorney. I wanna to change to a different person. Can I just cross out and put in a different name and just initial the change or do I need an entire new document? I would say you need a new document because those documents that you have, at least the financial power of attorney would have been notarized. Mm -hmm. So the, the, the notary wouldn't see it wouldn't have, it would not be valid uh, the no, because the notary didn't see the new name on there when, you know, that you, when they signed it and notarized it. So yes, you would want to uh, redo those documents. Okay. All right. Good. Um, next one, I'll field off to uh, you, Matt. Um, Janice also asked, my children live out of state. Is it better to have an executor who lives in Ohio? Um, so you know, the, the consideration there really is um, who, who, who is qualified and capable of handling your estate, um, who has, you know, the access. Um, we certainly see out-of-state family members uh, serve in that capacity. Um, in many cases, uh, the local um, attorney uh, that, that you're working with may end up doing a lot of the heavy lifting. Um, I, I guess I would um, really step back a little bit and just uh, think through, um, you know, if, if you're considering a family member in that capacity, do they have the, um, the, the time and the uh, capacity to, to do that job? Um, and uh, if the answer is yes, uh, great. Um, if the answer is no, um, there are uh, other institutions or um, uh, you know, individuals who can handle that working hand in hand with, with family members. Um, mm -hmm. There is um, a, a fiduciary responsibility on your executor or trustee. Um, that's a very high standard of law to be held to. Um, and so um, you know, consider the level of responsibility that you may wanna put on their shoulders at that point especially if, uh, you know, you would anticipate any um, uh, disagreements amongst children or heirs um, after you're gone. Do you want to put um, one of your children in that, um, in that position uh, to, be the, to bear the brunt? Um, mm -hmm. and, and so uh, maybe perfectly appropriate, um, you know, family members uh, who are out of state may be appointed um, think through whether that makes sense, though. And, and Bob, I'll, uh, I'll again ask for your thoughts on that as well. Well, the, uh, the laws of Ohio do not require, they used to, but they don't no longer require an executor to be someone who lives in the state. But oftentimes, it's, it's a question of convenience. If a home needs to be liquidated, needs to be in a state sale, all those kinds of things, it's so much more convenient if it's someone local um, than if it's someone out of state because they have to you know, leave work and come home and do take care of that. Um, and the thing to differentiate too here, people lump things together. The law does require a guardian, if, if you're gonna have a guardian of an estate where the person's still alive, but needs a guardian because they didn't have a power of attorney, they do need to be a resident of the state of Ohio. And I think that's just really goes to the point of the, the judge wants to be able to find them if there's any misdeeds. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I've got a couple questions related to letter of intent. The first one is from Michael and he asks, uh, should this be notarized? And how do you assure this does not cause uh, an after the fact tug of war. So that's the first one related to letter of intent. I'll, uh, I'll take a quick stab at that, um, please. Uh, Bob and Matt uh, jump in there. Well, one, one of the things you do with that letter of intent is you sit down with your legal um, counsel and you review that to make sure there's nothing in there that would contradict something in the will or in your trust. So, uh, so that, um, that helps make sure everything's nice and congruent and, and nothing in there that, that could, um, could conflict with the legal documents that you've already created. Good. The, yeah, the second part of that question actually came in from Mary. 
And um, Mary says, who has access to the letter of intent? Anyone and everyone, or is it a designated person? How does that work? Well, I, uh, I would recommend that it's kept with your will and testament and your trust documents. And then that way, whoever the executor or trustee is at your passing, that's who ends up with that paperwork and can, can functional, function to channel the letter of intent, uh, whether they need to gain other people from the family to help with that or not, but they would be the ones who would actually walk out the, the um, suggestions or the, or the thoughts in that letter of intent. Mm -hmm. Okay, had a couple questions come in related to children. Uh, first one from Daniel and Donna, and they say, I feel overwhelmed in trying to decide who should get what. What are your thoughts? And what are your thoughts just letting the children decide who wants what? Uh, I'll speak to that if I may. If you, if you have a will, uh, ultimately the executor has the authority. That's why I mentioned the, the memorandum of incorporation by reference where you can... Am I still on? Okay. Yes. yes. Heard something. Uh, where where you can designate uh, uh, certain items to go to certain individuals. Now, other cases, I have done something as simple as say, if you know, if more than one child wants an item, say grand grandpa's rifle or you know grandma's hutch or something, I suggest you draw lots or draw straws. I mean, uh, I have done that before. Um, I think it's important to be mindful. And always, it's best, I think, for parents to sit down with the children while they're alive and talk about these issues so that there are no surprises. And that, you know, so that they understand, maybe she, you'd think uh, Billy would like, you know, grandpa's rifle and says, well, I don't shoot guns. I don't want that. And, you know, so it's a good thing to really sit, sit down with them and um, discuss these things if possible. And uh, that way you don't have misunderstandings. Mm -hmm. Anything so, to add to that, Matt? Yeah, I, Bob, that's a fantastic point. I would echo that um, where uh, I, I would really urge you to consider um, communicating with your heirs uh, about your intentions. Mm -hmm. um, that doesn't necessarily mean, um, you know, telling them exactly what your net worth is or anything like that, but, but giving them an, an idea and an understanding of what your, what your intentions are after your passing. Um, I've, I've seen some really unfortunate misunderstandings. Mm -hmm. um, and, and just to, to use an example, you can't make this stuff up. Um, I, I had worked with a client uh, who had several children one of whom at a very, as a very young adult um, became a Buddhist and, and, and sort of very actually prominent in the West Coast Buddhism community. And our client um, very specifically and purposefully did not leave him any assets uh, because she understood him as having taken a vow of poverty. And when it came time to administer her estate, he, he, I, he said, God, what, what did I do to make mom mad? What, I don't understand. And she, you know, she had all of uh, nothing but the best of intentions. And yet he felt like he had, had, you know, gone afoul somewhere of her and um, really sad and, and we're able to say, no, no, that's not it at all. But he's not able to hear that from her. And, and so there, there was a misunderstanding that, that, you know, unfortunately, you can't can't go back in time and clear it up between them. So, um, you know, again, I I, I would echo Bob's uh, recommendation to communicate your your intentions and and think through if if there are some items that you think might cause some sticking points, talk about it in advance. Um, it it will. I, I I I would echo that recommendation. I'll give you another for example, uh, a personal one from my family. My uh, mom, who is a, she was an ICU nurse for 30 years. Her and my dad sat down and they discussed their healthcare power of attorney and decided that none of us children were going to have anything to do with it. They, uh, they chose a nurse friend 
many, many years younger than them who would be able to impartially follow their, um, their wills not to be put on life support for any long period of time and, and removed it from us and had that conversation with us. We were all really offended at first and then it sort of sunk in and said, you know, that's probably the best way to do it because we'd keep you two alive for as long as we could if, if not just to have you in the living room for Thanksgiving. So, so they knew, but it was a, a good conversation at the end. <laughs> And one, one thing I'd like to add to that, um, there is an issue when, when choosing a child, you know, you've got some children that are very sentimental and emotional. You've got some children that are, are not. And so it's important to choose the person, if you're going to choose a child to make in life decisions, that they're going to actually be able to make the call and not feel like I killed mom or I killed dad. And, uh, you know, that, that's, some people feel that way, others do not. But the way the, the statute is written, it goes in an order of priority, unlike financial power of attorney, where you can name two children to act together or apart from each other, whatever. But in the case of healthcare documents, it goes in the order of priority for that very reason, so that if kids disagree on what decision to make, somebody has, some one person has the decision. And that's usually made, usually in, in, in the setting of the hospital in conjunction with the doctor. Okay, good, good information. I have another one related to um, children. Um, they write, my only child is special needs. How can I leave my estate to him and not endanger his government benefits? So there is um, there are some specific uh, trust planning that can be done in a way that uh, the assets can be used to, to benefit that child, um, but set up in a way that uh, is the, the distributions uh, to or for the benefit of that child are in the discretion of a trustee, an independent trustee. Um, and so it, it's a, it is a fairly specialized type of planning, um, and you would definitely want to connect with an attorney that has experience creating that type of, of plan, uh, that type of, uh, we call it special needs trust. Um, yep, very prudent to be thinking about that. Um, and, and again, uh, that type of arrangement um, is not uncommon. Um, but you definitely would want to, uh, you know, if you're, if you're thinking about putting something like that in place, um, interview the attorney or attorneys that you're, you're, you would be um, enlisting and uh, make sure that they have specific experience in drafting that type of arrangement. Good advice. And I, I might add that, that this, the special needs trustees talking about, it's required by the state of Ohio to say that the any residue that's left over after the child's death goes to the state of Ohio to reimburse them for costs that they've expended on that child's behalf. So you, the trustee with application to the court can ask for permission to use money, say the child needs a, a new television and it's in their room at the nursing home or assisted living or needs some, some special medical thing or something you can apply and get permission to use that money uh, for the child's benefit. Uh, but then when the child is gone, and, and of course you can ask for permission, use that money to pay for their funeral in advance, which you should always do with a, a child that is special needs, prepay their funeral. So that's done. But then whatever's left goes back to the state that paid the lion's share of their care. Good advice. Um, this is related to um, children as well, uh, minors in fact. So Mary asks, so if no minors are involved, it might not be necessary to have both a will and a living trust? So I'll, I'll jump in on that. Um, entirely possible that the will might never need to come into play. Um, if there are no assets in your sole name, um, at your passing, there may be no reason to open an estate. And so the will exists, but never, never is um, filed with the probate court. Um, 
always recommend nonetheless having a will, um, what we would call a pour over will. If, if you wanna use that revocable trust as the backbone of your estate plan, we still recommend having a pour over will that says, hey, if at my passing, if there are any assets that I own in my name that I forgot to put in the trust, send them to the trust so that the trust still controls what happens to your assets. But um, if I buy a car and forget to title it um, or TOD it to the trust, or if I open a checking account that I forgot about and I don't title it in the name of my trust, um, any, any asset that isn't either designated to the trust through uh, a beneficiary designation or TOD, um, anything that's in my sole name, I wanna make sure it still gets in the trust uh, to control distribution. So, um, you know, if you, uh, I've seen plenty of instances where probate has not been required at all because of good front end planning, still recommend having that will there. Yeah. I'd like to emphasize what Matt says is absolutely correct because funding of the trust is so important. So if people have it, they think, well, I have a living trust, I'm all set up. But if you have not retitled your assets, whether they're large or small. Now you don't have to do that for personal property like your pictures or your furniture or that sort of thing. But anything that has a title to it or bank ownership, uh, you know, anything like that, any assets, any accounts, you really need to make sure. And if you've invested in new things since you did your living trust, it's good to check. Would you agree, Matt, every year or so to make sure that everything you have is in your trust? Yeah, to the extent that you keep a personal balance sheet or um, you know, kind of a personal financial statement, that's a good place to, to um, kind of refer to when you're um, looking to coordinate your, your planning. Okay, and go down each item on your, on your personal balance sheet gosh, is this titled in my trust or otherwise designated to my trust at my passing? Mm -hmm. Good. We've got one last question um, from Daniel and Donna, and it reads like this. We had a trust made while living in Arizona. We now live in Ohio. Will all the Arizona documents, medical, financial, et cetera, will all of that be upheld in the state of Ohio? Typically, if it, is, if it was legal in Arizona and you moved to Ohio, I think they would honor it here. Um, trusts are much more portable than wills, wills and powers of attorney and, and uh, healthcare documents are creatures of Ohio statute. Trusts are much more portable, and I'll defer to Matt on that, but I the better part of wisdom, if you're, if it's a short-term move, I wouldn't worry. If it's a long-term move, you might want to consult with an attorney and say, hey, does this all look okay? Your thoughts, Matt? Well, I, I would agree with that uh, generally, Bob, and, and just further mention, um, just echoing things you've already said that, um, and I'll, I'll be the first to admit, I'm, I'm really guilty of this. Um, you know, I did my own documents when um, my children were really young. Um, they're adequate, but they're due for review. A lot of life has happened to me and my family uh, since the last time I updated my own documents. So, um, you know, a, a lot of things can happen in a couple of years. Um, boy, the, look, look at the, the, the year that we've had. Um, so uh, periodically, every couple of years anyways, go ahead and pull out your documents, review them, make sure that they still say what you want them to say um, because uh, life changes. And, and so um, it, it, don't, don't, file and, don't file and forget. Um, definitely update from time to time. May I tell just a brief funny story? I dated a girl in California when I was living out there and VCRs had just come out and they were very expensive and I bought one. And so she gave me a hard time about it. So I left it to her in my will. And then I moved back here and I never, I didn't even remember that. And uh, I was getting married and pulled out my will. <laughs> and there, and no, I think I'd already gotten married and I was making a new will and I pulled it out, my old will out. 
and there I left my VCR to my old girlfriend. <laughs> and so, yeah, I, I agree with you, Matt. <laughs> we would also be remiss not to mention the fact that there has been studies done that show anyone who includes a charity or a nonprofit in their will or in their trust, or maybe even as a beneficiary, does tend to outlive their actuarial lifespan. So those of you who are thinking about including a nonprofit like, say, I don't know, maybe the University of Findlay, <laughs> you have a better shot of outliving your lifespan. So these, paper, these papers won't be needed for nearly as, as soon as the average population. Well, we have just received so many great questions. That's the end of, oh wait, we may have one more. Let's see. Um, Oh, <laughs> we've got we've got a comment, but we are done with questions. We've got um, no more questions to answer at this point. We have had so much content in this um, excellent webinar. Um, I have had a request from someone to actually send out the PowerPoint. And so I will be doing that. So guests, for those of you on the call today, you'll receive an email from me um, that has the PowerPoint in it. So we can definitely get that out share that to remind you of all the points made and, and then you are welcome to contact us or our panelists with any questions that you may have. Um, so much, so much to consider. I just wanna get my life in order now. I just wanna go out and make sure that <laughs> my documents are updated because I know mine are old, I admit it. And I gotta get in there and figure out what it is. I hope I don't have anything in there like Bob's VCR story, <laughs> but you never know. So it, it uh, pays to check. Um, what we like to do as we wrap things up is we like to uh, spin the wheel and give away, uh, give away a prize for those who gave up their time to be here with us today. And so um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go ahead and spin the wheel with the uh, guests that were registered for, for today. Um, you must be present to win. If I do call your name, please type your chat, your name or a comment in the chat so I know that you're here. Um, we do like to support Finley businesses. And so this gift today is from the Baking Company and Bread Needs right here in Finley, Ohio. Um, that is a great gift, uh, especially with Mother's Day coming up to get some really special um, treats for your family if you're having a small COVID safe uh, celebration. But if you're not in the Finley area, we are more than happy to send you something that will work in your location. So um, let me know if you're not in Finley. I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna share my screen and I'm going to um, spin the uh, wheel and we'll see if we can get a winner for, uh, for today. And I don't know why it's not coming up. Let's see. I don't know, uh, hold on a moment and let's see if we can get this to work. It just seems to me that my screen might be frozen. So I will shuffle the names and we'll do this the old fashioned way. So out of a shuffle, I'm calling Judy Miller. Is Judy on the call today? And if you are Judy, um, type your name in the uh, chat area. And if Judy doesn't answer, we will go on to the next person. So I don't think that Judy is here. So um, looking for Miriam, Miriam Vance. Is Miriam with us at the moment, at this moment? And I don't see Miriam weighing in. We will try another one. Um, we have Fred Golke. Fred, are you with us today? Fred and Donna uh, tend to join us on these often. Julie, maybe we wore everybody out. <laughs> I think, I don't know what happened. I don't know where they all are. Um, what we do with this, um, this list is this is for the entire day and then they pick and choose sessions. So, um, so we will try one more. How about Ann Albert? Is Ann here today with us? 
Yes. Okay, good. She said yes. Very good. So we will make sure you uh, receive that and we'll use the contact information that you use to register and then our office will send out um, your gift. I'm glad we I'm glad we found a winner for that one today. Um, next week, you'll have to come back and join us lifelong learners because at 10 o'clock we're going to feature the animal science uh, research that's being done right here on our campus and um, on Davis Street in the research labs. Dr. Brian Whitaker will be here to share with us his in vitro fertilization and reproductive uh, research that also aligns well with what's going on in human research. So he will tell us what he and his students are doing. And then right after that at 1230 next Tuesday, uh, you won't wanna miss our community update with alum mayor, Christina Murin. Uh, she will be joining us along with Crystal Wheats, uh, Director of Service and Community Engagement right here at UF. And they're gonna talk about uh, what's going on in the community now and coming up in the future. So register today for those. Call our office if you need help registering. We're more than happy to help you. We wanna thank you for joining us today from all of us um, here at the University of Findlay. If you've supported us previously, we, we so appreciate your generosity. Um, and if you enjoyed today's event and would like to make a gift, please visit give.finley.edu. So at this point, I will sign off. I want to make sure to say a special thank you to Matt, Bob, and Ken. And we thank all of the viewers for being here today. And we look forward to seeing you next week. Bye, everybody.